Hello, everybody. This is Dr. K, and I want to welcome you to Impact Bible Study with Pastor K. It is, again, my joy to be able to be with you on tonight. Uh, as you can see, I am not in my normal uh, area uh, where I do Bible study. On the road, uh, attending the Christian Community Development Association Conference in Kansas City. Uh, it is. It had already been an amazing time uh, of meeting and gathering, uh, fellowshipping and networking. Um, in Kansas City, particularly, there is something called the KC Underground, which is a micro church network movement. Um, they've been doing this for three years, but are built off of the things that have been done the last 20 years uh, in Tampa, uh, Florida. I'm telling you, uh, it has been a real blessing to see how God has been moving um, and transforming lives through the agency of ordinary people like you and I, uh, who have been engaged by God, empowered through the church and equipped that they might be able to effectively share the love of God and the story of God's glory with other people. Um, so it's exciting. Um, I'm just I'm just filled to the brim, um, ready to explode with just what has been happening so, thus far. Um, I want to uh, encourage you to make sure that you go uh, to the chat and let us know what your name is and from where you are watching. Uh, go ahead and say hello, say your name, uh, and and let us know from where you are watching on tonight. Tonight, um, because we are on a tight schedule, we won't do questions, but what I would love for you to do is to still put your questions in the chat so that I can receive them and be ready to answer them next week in our Bible study session. So we won't be answering questions tonight, but I'm still taking them. Go ahead and put your questions in the chat so that we can go ahead and be ready for next week where we can do our talk and discussion. Uh, tonight, super excited about our topic. Again, uh, we are looking um, at our topics uh, that are grounded in the outline of chapters that you find um, basically in the book, Church as Movement, in the book, Church as Movement. And let me tell you right now, um, that book is, you know, world changing, it's life changing, it's church changing. I, I really encourage you, if you want, uh, to know more about what God is doing in the body of Christ, both here and abroad, um, Church as Movement is the book for you. Uh, we are talking about how the church works, how the church works. Um, and listen, there have been different ways that the church has organized itself in different places and in different times and in different ger generations. Um, but underneath whatever developmental model for the church that we've had, there has been the work of God's grace and the Holy Spirit. Um, there has been a way to release the grace and love of God into the world. Um, and so what we want to do is understand those underlying principles uh, that will help us to understand what it means to be faithful to how God is moving in the world now. Let me say that more simply. God is moving in the world now. We need to know how to follow up. We need to understand and listen, the systems and structures that we have been used to, um, many of them has exceeded or have exceeded their usefulness. And this is the real conversation among these people who are really doing this work. We as a church have been called from the very beginning to be attentive to what God is doing in the world. This is what it means to rethink church. And so um, seven years ago, we started with a rethink church vision. Some of you who are new to us, even some of you who were, who were there from the beginning, you may still have the question, what does it mean to rethink church? And I'll tell you this, that it means that we get back to the basics and we understand how to engage, empower, and equip 
ordinary people to go out into the world where people are and build the church around them. That's what we were talking about. We're talking about a discipleship movement. We're talking about loving people to life effectively and creating community around them. Listen, one of the conversations that we've been having um, during this week, as I've been meeting with pastors and church planners and church leaders and micro church movement people, people are in trauma. And listen, a lot of us have been in trauma for a long time. But because of COVID, because of isolation, because of the economy, because of the vitriolic, violent atmosphere that we are living in in our world, that trauma has become acute. Listen, what we need more than ever is the tangible love of God. The tangible love of God overflowing out of the hearts of God's people. To, to, to number one, help and heal God's people, right? That's you and me. But then also to bring hope and healing to the world. And so, beloved, we, we really need to understand the principles. If you are just joining us uh, in this Bible study series, I highly encourage you to go back several, uh, several weeks and watch um, those uh, those uh, additions to this series because it's so important right now. We're not doing Bible study for Bible study's sake. We are being in a place to really hear from God in real time, understanding what God is doing in the church and in the world. So we're talking about how the church works. The book that we are using as a basis of conversation once again, it's called Church as Movement. We've talked about church, God's way. We've talked about rethinking leadership. We've talked about being disciples and making disciples. Today, what we are going to talk about is moving on mission. Moving on mission. And so we really want to get in our minds, though, because, you know, when you say moving on mission, that may not move you. That, that, that may not connect with you. What, what are we really talking about when we're saying moving on mission? Um, and, and how do we really get excited about this work? Okay. What is this work really about? What is really exciting about it? Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, on tonight. Um, I want to encourage you, if you would, to just uh, grab your Bibles, your tablets, your cell phones, or whatever it is that you're using in order to, um, in order to uh, engage the word of God. Make sure you have a notepad because there's gonna be a lot of things, a lot of principles that we're gonna be sharing. Um, and, and listen with an open heart and a prayerful heart. In fact, let's now begin with a word of prayer as we, um, as we start this work. Lord, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness to us. And we ask that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. I pray, oh God, that you will help us to understand, Lord, um, how you love us. Like Paul says, that we would see the breadth and the depth and the height and the length of your love be filled with the fullness of God and overflow, overflow so that we might find healing in our lives and bring hope to the world. And I'm grateful, Lord, for just being able to be a part of all of this. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. So tonight, again, we are talking about moving on mission. And so that we can be community again, I want to encourage you, if you've just come on, why don't you put your name in the chat box? Why don't you let us know uh, what city uh, or what part of the city you are watching the Bible study on tonight? We just want to hear from you tonight. Um, and please, 
uh, the more and more, if you're on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, the more and more you chat, the more and more Facebook uh, considers that there's something going on and lets people know that there's something going on. So go ahead and click your likes, go ahead and click your hearts, go ahead and type in the chat box. Um, let's, let's, let's chat it up tonight. Amen. Um, so again, we're talking about moving on mission. Now, let's start with this quote. Um, it's on page 120 uh, in the Church's Movement book. It says, people who have a reductionistic view of the gospel eventually become ashamed of it. Let me read that again. People who have a reductionistic view or reductionistic view of the gospel eventually become ashamed of it. And, and what, what are they saying? They're, they're basically, if all we're talking about is getting people saved so that they can go to heaven, but we don't talk about how they actually live in this world. They don't talk about how God brings justice and beauty into the world. If we don't talk about what it actually means to, to be uh, fully human and, and, and reflecting the glory of God, if we don't talk about any of those things, then eventually, yeah, you know what, we're going to have urgency and we're going to work hard. Eventually, we're going to burn ourselves out. Eventually, you know, um, we're going to be ashamed of it. Why? Why be ashamed of it? Because in, in, in the rest of the, of the uh, paragraph there, what they're saying is a lot of people, you know, when they're talking about the gospel and all they can talk about is heaven, but they're facing poverty and they're, they're facing racism and they're facing injustice and they're facing, you know, abuse and they're, they're facing, you know, uh, the, 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 the mistreatment of women or children or people because of their sexuality or whatever the case may be, right? When they face these things and the gospel doesn't have very much to say about it, or you come with these legalistic, you ought to do this and you better do that or else, Eventually, you find that that stuff doesn't bear fruit. It is not led by the spirit. You become ashamed of it. No, no, no. Being a part of what God is doing, being a part of living the gospel and sharing the gospel is not just about being an insurance salesman for heaven. No, the gospel really is good news. It's a good news of transformation. But guess what? Even more so, it's a good news for a loving fellowship. It is an invitation, listen, to a party. Take a look at this quote. Simply put, God wants you and I, or you and me, to come join God's party. When, when all this is said and done, we, you know, and, and I've, I've been throwing out a lot of words at you. I've been talking about evangelism. I've been talking about discipleship. I've been talking about service. I've been talking about mission. I've been defining the church and, and all of these terms. But when it's all said and done, net, net, like my, my friend Don Gant likes to say, net, net, simply put, God wants you and me to come join God's party. That's what God is up to. Now, as we look at this moving on mission piece, as we talk about joining God's party and all of that, um, we're actually going to break this into two or three different studies. Okay. So this one chapter has so much in it that we're not going to rush through it. We're going to deal with one section at a time. And this section tonight is moving on mission part one, God's party. What, what kind of party is God throwing? What, what is this party thing all about? All right, let's take a look at the word. Um, and this scripture is a scripture that we actually used uh, for our new sermon series, love.life, right? Um, and so in our new sermon series, love.life, um, we started off with 1 John chapter one, one through four. And here's what it reads. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. 
the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Check this out. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, verse 4 says this. We write this to make our joy complete. Now, let's take a look at this, this, this short passage here. Um, Number one, we, we talk about that which was from the beginning, okay? So what we're talking about is, is not something that simply started when the church started, started with, you know, Jesus and his 12 disciples. No, we, we're talking about something that goes back much, much further than that. When we think about the party, the party itself goes back from the beginning from the beginning, which we have heard. In other words, it has been something that has been talked about through the uh, writers of the Old Testament, the prophets and, and historians and poets. Um, we have heard about this party. We've heard about it. Um, and John says, which we have seen with our eyes. In other words, you know, um, he's not talking about we as in the inclusive we, not, not you and I along with him. He's talking about he and his, uh, his co compatriots, see, the disciples. They saw Jesus with their own eyes. They, they have looked at and, and with their own hands, they have touched. It was an experience in real time that they had with Jesus. He says, this week we claim concerning the word of life. The word of life is that which was from the beginning. But if you go back to John one in verse one, it says in the beginning was the word, but then it goes on. It says, and the word was with God and the word was God. Oops. Now we're talking about the reality that Jesus, who is the word, existed with the Father from the beginning. They had, from the beginning, a fellowship, a fellowship from the beginning. The word was with God and the word was God. Now, let me just stop. Let's take a deep breath for a minute because this is, this is gonna be some, um, some simple stuff, but we just gotta catch up to our minds and thoughts on this. We have from the beginning, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit as well, who live together in fellowship from the beginning, okay? And in their fellowship, there was something going on. Let's move forward. It, it talks about how uh, this eternal life has appeared. If you remember from my sermon, for those of you who heard it, when I say eternal life, it's not simply talking about everlasting life. It's not simply talking about life that never ends, life in heaven. No, eternal life is the life from the eternal realm, the life from eternity. It's talking about divine life. It's, it's talking about the, 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 the kind of living that existed before from the beginning, okay? Um, now, once again, let's catch up to ourselves. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit ha have, have life within themselves in fellowship. They live in fellowship together as one, okay? we get invited to be a part of that life, a part of that living, okay? Now, it goes on to say, 
we proclaim to you what we have heard so that, watch this, you may also have fellowship with us. Check that out. John says, I'm telling you this, not so you can go to heaven, not so that you can, you know, um, you know, be holier than thou or, or say you remember. No, I am declaring this good news to you so that you can join the fellowship. And let me be clear about the fellowship. The fellowship that we have is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, get your get get your get your thinking cap on for a minute. John is saying, in the beginning, there was the Word and the Father and the Spirit, and they were in fellowship, right? And we have been invited into the fellowship that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit has. Okay? Now, I'm using the word fellowship because that's what's here in the scripture, but maybe it would be helpful if I used a different word. Because what the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit had was a party. They had a party. And we are invited to their party to be a part of that fellowship, to be a part of that coming together, to be a part of the life of that, okay? That's what is, is going on here, okay? Um, so, you know, it, it's like being invited to the dance, okay? Um, my, 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 my son and my daughter just last weekend went to their home coming dance, okay? And it was a time of fellowship. And, and apparently, you know, my son was starting new dance trends and, and my daughter was having a blast. Um, and all of this, listen, um, when you go to a homecoming dance or you go to a prom or something like that, you know, a lot of times there is a part where somebody invites somebody else to the dance. That's What's this is like? God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit are having a dance. And what they have done is they have extended the invitation so that the church can be a part of that dance. The church can, can have that party. And then the church can invite people from the world to join that party. And, and then in verse four, it says, We write this to make our joy we write this to make our joy complete check that out we write this to make our joy complete so in other words you know this fellowship is so that we all can be in a state of joy we can enjoy we can be at joy we can have a good time now this may be blowing somebody's mind, but let me tell you, being a part of what God is doing is not all about work. It's really all about being able to join in the party. It's about joining in the party. Tonight, let's talk about, um, talk about the party. Let's talk about the dance, the invitation, and then um, I wanna say something about impact everywhere. Let's talk about the dance, talk about Im the invitation, and then let's talk about impact everywhere. Now, when we look at the dance, okay, in the book, it talks about the social nature of God, okay? The social nature of God. What we understand about God is that God is Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? Now, um, the early, or at least earlier church, back in the seventh century, um, Christians described, you know, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit as a dance. It was a dance, like a choreographed dance between the three persons of the Trinity. The Greek word is perichoresis. Um, and you know what? Sometimes I, I throw out some words at you, 
Um, and, you know, they are new words, they're fresh words, they're, they're words from, from another language at another time. But I, I, I do that for a reason. I want you to know that the things that are going on today are connected to the things that have gone on before. And a lot of times when we think about the church, we only think about the church in our time, or at least going back 50 or 60 years. Okay, the church goes back 2000 years. You should know your heritage. You should know the richness of what God has done over 2000 years. Here is an example of that. So in the seventh century, they, they, they had a way of describing, you know, the nature of God and the, and the Trinity as a perichoresis, as a choreographed dance. And, and the idea is to help us to see God as relational, right? Now think about this. It's a really cool thought. What came first, creation or love? It's a deep thought, isn't it? Did love come first or did creation come first? If all we had was you know, one person, no trinity, if you will, then when God creates humanity and the world, then love is created. Because, you know, um, outside of God loving God's self, there is no, you know, subject object. There's no, there, 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 there are no, you know, two individuals to love one another, right? But because we understand that there has been an eternal dance, an eternal party, an eternal fellowship, an eternal relationship, we can know that love precedes creation. Love was first. Love was first. This is, this is essential to the nature of God. Love is essential to the nature of God. Love is not a responsibility of God. Love, love is not something that God does as a benefit or, or as a secondary thing. Love is primary to God. God is relational. God is love. Okay. And that's important for you to recognize and for me to recognize because a lot of times when we live our Christian lives, we live our Christian lives based on duty, based on responsibility. You know, uh, this is what you better do if you want to go to heaven or all these other kinds of things, right? But the thing is, the first thing for God is love. The Bible says God so loved the world, all right? The Bible talks about God perfecting love in our hearts. The Bible talks about the, the first commandment is that we would love God and then love our neighbors as ourselves. Because love comes first. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's important for us to recognize the, the jeopardy and the danger that a soul may be in when they don't know Jesus, right? But, but our, our goal is not for duty's sake. Our goal is for love's sake. And when we love one another, we bring ourselves into fellowship. It's, it's not, okay, let me just go out there and tell you about Jesus, but I don't ever see you again. There is a, there's a sense of, of doing that at some times. You know, we do street evangelism. And, but but if, we, if we don't have a general sense that we can invite people into a fellowship, and we're really not living the love that God really wants us to live. God is relational, and he wants us to be relational as well. Let's take a look here at the fellowship of God, okay? John chapter 5, 16 through 20 says this. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. So this is one of the stories where Jesus had done a miracle and now and now the leaders are mad because he did the miracle against, you know, their tradition and, um, and what have you. In verse 17, it says, in his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to do this very 
very day. I mean, sorry, my father's work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried to all the more to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son, the son does also. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. Look at the dance. Look at the dance. You have the father showing the son. You have the son listening to the father. You have the father bequeathing to the son power and ability and grace and miracles in order to get certain work done. You see, it's a dance between the two. There is an engagement. The father has loved the world through the son. The son has loved the world by the father. And this, this is what the dance is all about. This is what the dance is all about. And, and, and if we were to go later on to like chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, then you have the Holy Spirit also as a part of this dance. The Holy Spirit being sent by the Father and the Son into the world in order to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You, you have the Holy Spirit being a part of the fellowship, a part of the dance. Okay. Now, yes, there is a goal here. Yes, God is, is working to redeem the world, to save the world, but but it's more than just an operation, like you know, when you know the, the seals went in to go get Osama bin Laden. No, it's not, it's not just that kind of saving operation. No, there is a relationship, a coordination, and a love and a beauty that goes along with this fellowship. Okay. Now, when we talk about when we talk about the dance, the dance is a choreographed work. God is doing something. The Holy Spirit is doing something. Jesus is doing something. All right? Now, in this party, in this fellowship, in this dance, God is inviting us into the dance as well. So we see the invitation. You see the invitation. The invitation is, is demonstrated in the sending nature of God. The, the book talks about the sending nature of God, okay? So, you know, God is not simply, you know, in God's space, minding God's own business. God wants to bring the humanity that God made in God's own image into the dance. And so, the father sends the son. The father and the son send the Holy Spirit. And then God sends the disciples into the world to go and make disciples of all the world. There is an invitation that's going on, okay? God invites people to God's party, okay? God's fellowship of love, okay? God's coordinated work, okay? Now, the church, listen to this carefully. The church is God's party on earth. So, you know, um, there are times, high times of worship that we have and sometimes we might get to shout, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. That's being a part of God's party, okay? The church is God's party on earth. We are a part of God's dance, okay? And so 
um, we, we get a chance now to watch this, have this party on the planet. While the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in all of eternity has been having this fellowship of love, this dance, this party together. Now, um, you know, we were separated by the sin of Adam and Eve and, and separated by the corruption of sin and death. We have been separated from that party. But Jesus has come to open the doors to that party for us again. And what Jesus does is he sets up the church so that we can be the representation of that party on the earth. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to be, you know, somber, sad, sick headed people who are always, you know, waiting for hell to take over so and so that the rapture can come and so we can escape and go to hell. No, no, that's that's not the, the way that the Bible is written. The way that the Bible is written is that there is a joy that we can have even right now. Paul says in the book of Romans that the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking, but is about, is about um, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Jesus talks to us all the time about our joy being made complete. In the verse that we talked about a minute ago, John says, I'm telling you this so that our joy or maybe your joy can be complete. So we're not talking about just a joy that comes later on in the future once the heavens and the earth are renewed. No, we're talking about the fact that we get a chance to be a part of a party right now. The church is God's party on earth, okay? Now also, as a party, as a fellowship, we are a fellowship of light. So watch this, the world overcome with shadow, of death, of destruction, of deviance, of lying, of, 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 of all manner of evil. Watch this, devilishness. The world is under the shadow of all that. We bring hope and joy into the world by being a fellowship of light. By being a fellowship of light. We can live in the light with all of our scars and foibles and, and, and failures and, 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 and the, the, the causes of our guilt and our shame. We can live in the light because of the grace and mercy of Jesus who covers us and, and, and redeems us. We can live in the light being the sinners that we have been because we've been forgiven. And so we no longer have to carry the load of guilt and shame. No longer have to bury, bear the burden of our past, of our wrongdoings. No, we, we can live in the light and live in truth. And we can love in truth as a fellowship of light. Let's take some scriptures on, on, onto this. When we talk about God's invitation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 20 comes to mind. Verse 18 says, all this is from God who reconciles us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Now, this is the invitation. The invitation, going back 
Amen. I'm sorry. The invitation going back is that what God is doing is we we have fallen away from God because of Adam and Eve's sin. But God is reconciling us to himself. He's re-inviting us to the party. He's re-inviting us to the party. And as he re-invites us to the party as his church, then we also get a chance to invite the rest of the world. We become the agents of invitation. We become the ones that pass along the word that God has opened the doors again. It's like when I was in high school, I would hear about a party, right? Now, a lot of parties that were happening, you know, were word of mouth. I would hear about a party. And what, what did I do? I went and, and told my policy so that we could all go to the party too, okay? And that's what God has done. God has let you and I hear about the party and be a part of the party. But, but now God wants us to invite other people into the party. Okay. That's what it means when it says he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. It means that we are the ambassadors through whom God is making God's appeal. He's invited us to the party to be a part of the party. And now we get a chance to invite others. And that's part of the joy of this work, the joy of this life in God. Now let's talk about the church as God's party. John chapter 17, 20 through 23. Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. I'll, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Well, when you talk about giving them the glory, what are we talking about? We are talking about glory. We're talking about good time. We're talking about, we're talking about brightness. We're talking about weightiness. We're talking about, you know, I'm telling you right now, you know, when I go to a party, I go to the glory. I go to have a good time. I go to rejoice. I don't go to be a, wall, a wallflower. <laughs> Jesus says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Okay. Now, for those of you who are having a rough time with this understanding of the party, please understand this, that when God is talking, it's not about position, it's about relationship. Find that throughout the scripture. God calls Israel his wife. God calls Abraham his friend. He calls Moses his friend. It's about relationship. Jesus says about his disciples, you are my friends. And so the glory is not about, you know, gold and power and might. The glory, the glory is in the love and in the relationship and in the joy and the happiness that you have with one another. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. But the unity is not brought about by us having status. The unity is about us having love and relationship. That's, that's the glory that Jesus has given to us. Us. He has invited us to be a part of And now that we're all a part of this party, we're having a good time together with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But check this out. It's not just a party that we have somehow spiritually projected in heaven. But we're having a party in this world. The world sees us in this party. The world sees the Holy Spirit in us. The world sees us drawn together, loving one another, putting up with one another, dancing together, sometimes stepping on each other's feet because we ain't really learned how to dance right yet. But 
still being gracious, still being loving, still being kind. The world will see the party and the good time and want to be a part of it. Hallelujah. The church is God's party on the planet. Now we are to be a fellowship of light because the world is covered in a shadow. It's covered in a shadow. First John, <clears throat> uh, first John, not 17, 20 to 23, I'm sorry. Um, first John chapter one, verse five and six and seven, I believe. Here's what it says. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. So we, we are the place where people can really be real. You know, people really, you know, um, trip me out talking about, you know, being real. And, and what they mean by being real is being raw. Let me say that again. What a lot of folk mean by being real is be raw. And God is not calling you to be raw. He's calling you to be real. Now, sometimes that realness will uncover, you know, the, the raw parts of our life. But realness is not just about being raw. It's about being, it's, it's about understanding the grace and love and forgiveness and purification and righteousness that Jesus provides for us and in us. We can walk in the light. Why? Because of the blood of Jesus that purifies us from all sin. I can tell you my story. I can tell you my foibles. I can tell you my failures. I don't have to be perfect in everything that I do, and neither do you. And we can be in the light and, and encourage each other. And, and like I said, when, when we step on each other's foot, then we can love each other and correct each other, you know, sometimes, you know, with a bit of assertiveness, right? But with a bit of strength, right? But but we can we can do that because because we're in the light. We're not in the darkness. We're not trying to hide. We're not we're not we're not saying one thing and then trying to live another kind of way. You know, and I'm not saying that you don't get tempted. I'm not saying that that you don't stumble and fall at times. But even in those cases, the light shows you up, and then we can love each other well enough to cover one another's sin and keep one another in fellowship. We are a fellowship of the light. And that's that's one of the dopest things. Okay. Let me let me say parenthetically right now. There are so many people who are out of fellowship. They don't fellowship with their families, they don't fellowship with their friends. They hang out with people, but they are still alone in this world. But there's nothing more that we need in this world than fellowship, than to have somebody love us, love us for who we are. Not just when we do well, not just when we, when we do right, but to love us for who we are. The party that Jesus invites us to allows us, even when we don't know how to dance, to come out there and dance. And everybody will celebrate with us. That's, that's awesome. It has saved my life so many times just to know that I'm in the fellowship of the light. And I can really be me and know that God is working in me to both willing to do good and to do what God wants. God's mercy and love and forgiveness are mine. Now, um, let me let me close out tonight this way. We we'll talk about impact everywhere. When we talk about the church, 
as God's party in on the world, in the world, I should say, on the planet. But when we talk about the church as God's party on the planet, one way that we should imagine it is that, you know, wherever the church meets is basically a virtual party. Okay. I want to I want you to harken back to the 2000 and what was it 2008 election um leading up to that election that's the election where uh you know the candidate was Barack Obama and in that election um um Barack Obama did some really really new stuff um and what what Mr. Obama would do is he would have campaign parties virtually. He would reach out to people via email and text, but then um, they would sometimes connect virtual parties where people would come together in people's homes and then they would plug in, you know, via TV or via computer. Um, and they would have a virtual party. Everybody's partying everywhere in their own place. Well, that's the way the church works. And that's the way the church has always worked. It is a virtual party. We need to understand that when we come together, it's a, it's a party, but guess what? People are partying everywhere else. But let me expand that idea a little bit more. Because you know what? We, we can have more parties than what we're having. We can have parties all over the city. These virtual parties that um, people are coming together from house to house, in barber shops and beauty shops, at community centers or clubhouses, at restaurants and libraries, virtual parties everywhere. We don't just have to wait to all come together in one big building. We we can we can now understand the power of going where people are and building the party around them there. Our model has been, we're having a party over here, everybody come over here. But, but maybe our model needs to be that we need to find where the people are, the people who, who are broken, who are hurting, who are, who are, um, are listless, who are, are sad, who are, are, are suffering and, 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 and being smothered by life. And, and maybe, maybe we can start off the party with them right where they are. Okay. Imagine having these lighthouse fellowships, these parties shining in the shadows all over. Not just one big light in one small place, but let's have the light scattered abroad. So everywhere you go, you know how when you're flying at night and you look down and, and you can see all of the different lights illuminating? Well, that's the way we should be in the spirit with all of our lights illuminating in all these different places. There are people who will never step foot into a church house, but you can go and, and, and meet them where they are and bring the party to them. That's impact everywhere. That's impact everywhere. You know, Paul says in Romans 15 and 20, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. A lot of times what we do in the church is we do member swapping. Well, I, I move from, you know, from this state to that state and I need to find a church or I don't like my church anymore and I'm gonna go and move and go to another church or, um, you know, we go out, we, we, when we're trying to witness and, and build our church, we go and try and find the people who are already in church. No. What we need to do is go to the places where the love has been already lost. Go into the dry places, the destitute places, the barren places, the places where there is no water. 
no food, no spiritual food, and give the bread of life and the water of life. We, we need to go where Christ is not known. And we need to meet people there. And we need to sow the gospel there. And we need to build the church around people there. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father who is in heaven. You and I are the lights. And we shouldn't be hidden. We shouldn't be hidden. Shouldn't be hiding in a building. We shouldn't be hidden. We should be out in the world. We should be lights in the world, providing hope amid the shadows. At Impact Church, our mission is to love people to life in Jesus Christ in a way that transforms lives and transforms a generation. But to do that mission well, we must go where people are and build the church around them. Beloved, um, I'm grateful for you all joining us on tonight. I'm gonna encourage you to, to consider, to pray, to really uh, reflect and hear God's spirit. How can God use you to invite people to the party? That's the question. Until we come again on next week, let me say this to you. If you have heard anything tonight, I want you to hear most of all that God loves us and wants to have fellowship with us. God wants us to be a part of God's party. And in that, beloved, if you are out of fellowship with God, if you don't know Jesus, if you've never put your heart in, in God's hands, or if you have fallen away, or if you know that there's more for you to be and do, I encourage you to hear God's call right now. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Receive that love and plan. Accept what God has for you. Move into that, live into that, lean into that. If you want to accept that, I invite you to pray with me now. Lord Jesus, I need you. Say it with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Please come into my life and make me the person you want me to be. I put my trust in you, my hope in you. Thank you. Jesus, for dying on the cross for me, for the forgiveness that you've given me, for the love that you've shown to me, and for how you are even now pouring out that love in my heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come in, make me who you want me to be. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And beloved, if you prayed that prayer, that's your great first step. I do want to encourage you as well to go to our website at icdfw.org, icdfw.org. Fill out the connect card there on the website. Send that in. Let us hear from you tonight so that we can reach out to you with the love of God and, and, and the fellowship that God has called us to. Now, this is Pastor Kwesi Kamal, and I thank you for watching again tonight. Until next week, I certainly want to encourage you to be with us on this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. for our service as we continue the Love.Life series. And then join us again next week on Wednesday at 7 p.m. with Impact Bible Study with Pastor K. This is Kwesi Kamau, and we are Impact Church. We're anointed to make an impact, and we don't just talk about it. We be about it. God bless you, and have a good night.